I want to welcome Jim Avila. Hi, Jim. Good morning, Kim. How are you? I'm good. I'm, of course, you are a former White House correspondent for ABC. Uh, Mark says, he always says you won the Peabody Award, but it's a Peabody Award. Um, and the <laughs> Edward R. Murrow Award as well. So you are, uh, shall we say, an award-winning journalist. You have been places, you have seen things. And I covered September 11th from a chair in a newsroom in San Francisco, but you were at ground zero. You saw it, you felt it. Um, I remember feeling so incredibly depressed in the weeks following September 11th. I think um, I felt like my soul had just been sucked out. So depressed. I can't imagine standing there and reporting on it and how you must have felt. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, fortunately, we kind of develop a news callus about yeah. these things. And it's, uh, you know, it, in some ways it's good, in some ways it's not. Uh, I was in Chicago, actually, at the time that it happened. Uh, I was getting out of the shower, getting ready for the morning meeting. At, I was working at NBC News at the time for Brokaw. I was his national correspondent. And uh, the phone rings and they said, turn on the TV. And it was New York. My boss is there. And then the second plane went in and they said, phone rang again, and they said, get on a plane, uh, come to New York. So I immediately uh, got on the way to the airport. And uh, while I was on the way to the airport, they closed every airport in the country. Oh. Um, so uh, I went back to our bureau in Chicago uh, and a couple of things interesting happened. We started to I was going to have the first story about reaction around the country, what was going on uh, about that, and that would play on Brokaw's evening news. Uh, so one of the things we did was, at that point, you remember, it was the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and the field in uh, Pennsylvania right. uh, where the planes crashed. Uh, but they were concerned that there were other planes still in the air. Yeah. And they sent us immediately to, with a live hot camera, to the Sears Tower in Chicago, because it was thought that that might be another, the next target, because at that point, uh, you know, after the World Trade Center went down, it was the tallest building in the country. Right. Uh, so <clears throat> we went. Uh, I didn't, it, nothing happened, fortunately, there. I did uh, my live shot from in front of the Sears Tower and uh, a piece about what the reaction was around the country. And then my crew and I, actually two crews, several producers and I got in a caravan of cars and we drove to New York City overnight. So we left around 7 p.m. and we got there to the uh, bridge uh, from New Jersey uh, just before 7 a.m. And we did our live shot right for the bridge looking across to the skyline of New York City where you could still see the smoldering pit. Uh, of what was going on. And it didn't really hit me uh, what had happened until after my morning Today Show live shots at that time and went across. Uh, and then we went across and we couldn't get right to ground zero at that point. They were keeping people out. We were on the West Side Highway, if you knew, knew New York City. Um, that is a live shot there that was doing from the top of 30 Rock. And you can kind of see how hazy it is down toward the Empire State Building and then past that toward uh, uh, toward the, the downtown area where yeah. the World Trade Center was. And you notice there's no World Trade Center there at that point. Yeah. And instead there was uh, this still remains dust cloud over all of, uh, uh, all of Manhattan. So we went there and we, we were on the West Side Highway at that point and we're parked outside uh, along with, you know, just a, I would say, 60 media cars with, you know, their satellite dishes up and and uh, everybody going live. And then on the other side of the street were all the emergency vehicles, fire engines, um, so as far as you could see, ambulances, as far as you could see. Uh, and then you know, what really hit me is when I walked down the street a few blocks away to Greenwich Village area, where they have these little parks in New York City uh, where they have, they're kind of, uh, they're, they're encased by these wrought iron fences. <clears throat> and they usually have a little park bench. And uh, 
and I was looking there, walking through there, and I see these pictures of people being put up on the on the wrought iron fence, mm. and on any any kind of any kind of uh, surface, and they're pictures of people who are missing, who people were hoping that they would see, yeah. and that still to this day chokes me up. Um, because that really brought it home. That was what really said to me, there's a lot of people who we're never going to find. Yeah. And of course, there were. And New York City was, and it did transform New York City in, in I don't want to say a positive way, but let me just say, I, I, I traveled to New York a lot in those days. And then later on, when I moved to ABC, I lived in New York for five years. And I can tell you there was night and day uh, it it brought out a kindness in New Yorkers that a lot <laughs> that a lot of us had not seen before. Yeah. And uh, so, if there was anything positive about it, it was that people were walking, uh, you know, from downtown to uptown to work. That's a you know that's about a three mile walk. You'd see people. The streets were still closed, so the streets were filled with just pedestrians walking their way to, to work or to see family or to get back home. People walked across the Brooklyn Bridge to get to Brooklyn. Uh, it made it a much more uh, community-oriented place in the, in the days right after. So that was, the, that was the, my initial feelings at that point. Um, but I think like a lot of Americans, especially New Yorkers, uh, are still raw, even this, this 22 yeah. years later. Um, it, it's, it, you know, it is, it was a scar on this nation and we came to know each other a lot better, I think, in some ways. Uh, and then there are other ways we can talk about that it made us a, not as good a nation. Really? What do you, th why? I mean, let's talk about that because when, when I think of what happened in the aftermath of 9-11, I think of the patriotism. I, earlier, uh, I was on the Nikki Maduro show and uh, someone in the chat said it was fake patriotism, but I didn't feel that. I felt at the time, and I still feel, that it was a moment where all Americans were united against something that happened to us because it may have happened in New York, but it was an attack on all Americans. That's how I felt. And so when people started putting the flags on their cars and flags on their homes and f stickers on their windows and whatever it was, I felt like at that time, at that moment, that this was a united states. Like this was our, I've never seen us come together. That was I, what I felt was the good out of it. What do you think was the bad? Well, <clears throat> I agree with you, especially in the immediate aftermath, there was yeah. a beauty of the togetherness in this country. George Bush, of course, went to ground zero mm -hmm. and gave a moving speech uh, off the cuff, answered questions. Mm -hmm. And I think that mm -hmm. he was a uniting force in the immediate immediate aftermath. And I think Democrats and Republicans uh, did come together and that was a good thing. Fast forward to Iraq. It gave Americans and it gave George Bush and mostly Dick Cheney an excuse to attack a country and get that landed us, in it, landed us in a war that was not justified, had nothing to do with 9-11, and that killed Arabs and Americans uh, unnecessarily and was another scar in this country. So did it, it changed it for the worse in, that, in my mind for that reason. It also changed it for the worse, uh, you know, it was the first time we had to uh, uh, go through TSA. Yep. Uh, Homeland Security was invented. Um, it made us all more suspicious of each other. Probably necessarily so. You know, we had to start later on because of the shoe bomber. Uh, we had to start taking our shoes off at the airport. Yep. All kinds of things happened. We didn't used to have to go through metal detectors to go to a Dodger game or to a right. Giants game. Um, you know, though those were um, things that are foreign to us and were caused by 9-11. Yeah. Uh, it also made us um, overly suspicious of anyone 
with dark skin or with an Arab background or Muslim background. Well, we saw um, that attacks on Arab Americans increase dramatically after September 11th. So yes, that was an um, ugly, ugly part of the history. And speaking of ugly, Donald Trump, of course, mm -hmm. pretended that he saw uh, you know, people, Muslims, celebrating, uh, and that just was not true. Uh, it, nobody could ever find that as happening. Uh, so, yes, people used it for their, you know, Trump used it to foment his hate that he always has. And it did make us a more suspicious people after that. So those were the, the downsides, besides the fact that so many people lost their ways and their lives. And in many ways, we lost our way of life. Uh, we, we lost a lot of freedoms um, because of what happened on 9-11. We did. And I remember hearing, well, <clears throat> in Israel, people have had to check their bags at the mall and open their bags for security officers at the mall for decades. This is nothing new. This is a way of life for most people, America. You have been, you know, uh, naive up until now. You have been lucky up until now that you haven't had to face the, you know, the horrors of the world like everyone else has. Welcome to the party. I remember yes, hearing we... hearing that. And, and it's true that, you know, still, I think in this country, we don't have to ha open our purses as we walk into the mall or the grocery store or anything else that in other countries they still have to do. Do you feel like we're safe enough? Have we given up too many rights or not enough rights or freedoms? It's, a, it's certainly a difficult balance. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it does appear to have worked, okay? We haven't had certainly an attack on that scale uh, since wood. then. Yeah. And we have been instead become our own worst enemies because of our gun culture that is uh, in fact it's you know it's not bombs anymore it's not planes in the buildings uh it's um uh, lone wolf like white extremists uh white national extreme extremists uh with with guns uh that are doing the damage uh for the most part um you know and then so that you know so have we have we lost a lot of freedoms at this point it's a bit of an inconvenience to have when you go to a a sporting event you have to you know open your purses or a concert it's probably it does make us feel safer and it and uh there are there's an argument to say it has made us safer because we haven't had a repeat of what that was uh and our uh, intelligence services uh, have done a better job and obama his administration went and found Osama bin Laden, and they killed him. Um, there was, you know, that we wiped out um, Al Qaeda for the most part, uh, and you know, there were there are things to criticize about how we did that. The, you know, I, I'm critical of the way we use drones uh, to because they're so indiscriminate and they make so many mistakes. But on the other hand, do you want to send troops in every time? So, you know, that it's a balancing act all along. And I don't know that anybody can say one, or another, one way or another whether it's been a good thing or a bad thing for our personal safety. Uh, I was reading an article last night. I was going to send it to you, but it was kind of too early in the morning. I'm like, I can't email Jim Avila at 1 a.m. Um, but I was reading this NPR article about Marines Many of, of, of uh, the United States Marines right after September 11th had joined because of September 11th. Many members of the military, you know, people were inspired by what happened, not inspired, but moved to join by what, you know, what happened. Now, the Marines that are joining today, for them, 9-11 is history. They weren't born. They didn't go through it. Right. And so it's a new generation of members of our military, and then this article specifically talks about U.S. Marines, um, the the drill sergeant says, by a show of hands, who was born after the September 11th attack? And almost all of them born after the September 11th attack. So Not I don't, sure. I mean, I don't know <clears throat> how it matters unless the passion or patriotism or the reason that you're fighting is made more clear if you lived through it than if you didn't. I mean, do you think it makes a difference or do you think um, maybe it's just an interesting factoid? I don't know. Well, I think 
you know, time does do that. You know, you yeah. know for us, it's sort of like December 7th, uh, you know, World War II and Pearl Harbor is in our mind as history. It's right. We didn't go through it, this our generation. You know, we, right. um, our parents went through it. Our parents went through the depression. You know, those type of things, we can look back and we see the long lasting impressions yeah. were made by those world events. You really can't blame young people who did not live through 9-11 uh, for not being, for it not being as open and a sore as it as it is for those who did, um, you know there there was a great deal of patriotism and a, and there were lots of people who uh, joined the military or became a first responder uh, because of what what happened right in the aftermath of nine eleven. I suppose that's a good thing. Um, you know I, I'm <clears throat> I'm more of a pacifist than most. You know I don't. You know, I really, you know, going into Afghanistan, Afghanistan, there was justification for that. It had become a breeding ground for terrorists, and it was the headquarters of Al-Qaeda. Uh, you know, I went among the first journalists to go to Afghanistan afterwards, um, took a, uh, a plane. It was it just, it, it's, this, the travel stories are just amazing. In order to get there, you know, there weren't flights into Kabul at that time. Uh, my crew and I you know, kind of went to Moscow, flew to Moscow, uh, then took a plane from there to Uzbekistan, uh, waited around for a military transport because we had a military base in Uzbekistan, um, and then drove in with the Northern Alliance, got to the Northern Alliance was a group of militia people uh, in Afghanistan who the United States supported and gave weapons to. Uh, so we got in the back, um, actually NBC purchased several Land Rovers that were armored and we got in those, in, in those, uh, armored vehicles and we and the Northern Alliance people in their pickup trucks, uh, you know, the famous white Toyota pickup trucks with people hanging out the side with machine guns. And they escorted us to, across the border and down, uh, into Kabul. When I got into Kabul, there were still remnants of the fighting. Uh, that the Americans had did had done <clears throat> with the Northern Alliance as their allies, and the Northern Alliance had there were still bodies, Taliban bodies, hanging from from headlights, from uh, oh. streetlights, wow. uh, you know, where the, on the main roads. Uh, it was that raw, that uh, incredible. We had to walk up when we got there. There, there used to was a place called the Intercontinental. It was not an Intercontinental that you think of. It was a hotel. But there was no electricity. Uh, we had to walk up to the we had to carry satellite dishes and walk up the, the twenty stories uh, up to the top to put to set that all up. There was no running water. Uh, the networks brought in cases and cases cases of, of water. We would uh, stand in the shower and pour water over our heads uh, from bottled water to take showers. <clears throat> it was. Uh, you know, those were some of the life changing and journalism changing events, you know, for me. And unfortunately, as I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, we put this cat, we form this callus when we're journalists, yep. especially when you the, the horrors that we see, uh, that's how we deal with, that's how I deal with it. You know, yeah. I didn't contemplate it that often. I didn't really contemplate the dangers at all, even though, you know, I had, while in Kabul, I went with the, with the army into Tora Bora uh, and, and went with militia people into the caves uh, where, where Osama bin Laden had been hiding. There were still remnants of Al-Qaeda around. He wasn't there. He had left already. But, you know, I, there were, I heard bullets whiz by. I heard bullets hit the wall behind me and ping on the ground. I brought one home, um, shell, a shell. So you know, even though it was there, I never really felt uh, that danger until one day, and then she's in Baghdad later on. I was staying at the, the hotel, the NBC, a small hotel NBC had purchased for their staff. Um, and two IEDs put in front of the hotel exploded. And a couple people in our hotel were killed. Yeah. Uh, and I had to do a live shot for the Today Show mm. about it. And my kids were watching. Yep. This kind of stuff still gets to me. Yeah. 
Um, and I wish I could just reach through the screen and give you a big hug right now. Yeah, that's hard. And afterwards, my daughter called. We were standing like seventh grade. Yeah. And she said, please don't. Oh, it's hard. It's like picking open old wounds, you know, here it comes. She said, please come home. Yeah. And I did. And uh, NBC was very good about it. They sent me home. Uh, I told them I was not going back. I had been going every every other month for a couple years at that point. Um, and uh, eventually I changed jobs to go do 2020 at ABC where we didn't cover the war. Yeah. Um, I'd seen enough. So yeah, it's a tough, very tough time for this country, for individual people. Um, you know, those first those first responders at 9-11, getting back to the main subject here, yeah. uh, they were so harmed, both mentally and physically, uh, by what they saw and what they had to breathe in that place. So, you know, it did a lot of damage to this country. Well, I want to talk to you about what's happening right now. But let me just read you this quote, which speaking about people that are now entering the military service that didn't live through it. There's a um, poli sci teacher at Duke. His name is Peter Fever. What a great name that is. His quote is this to NPR. My sense is for my entering students and those uh, thus for those entering military service too. 9-11 feels as historical and remote as the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Cuban Missile Crisis, or Pearl Harbor. It has been taught, but it has not been felt. What you just took us through with your children being concerned and you having concerns over hotels being bombed, because I remember it, yeah, that wasn't the only hotel that was bombed. You were at serious right. risk of bullets whizzing by, of being in particular harm and danger, and our military members as well, obviously. That is, that's, that's felt. It's obviously, it's still felt. You still feel it today. Those yeah. feelings don't go away. And so, you know, they're saying that people joining the military today aren't joining because they felt that fear or they felt that pride in America. They're joining more often, not that they're not patriotic at all, but they're joining because they're looking for benefits, college money, or um, person, somehow, somehow personal improvement. They're not joining because this is America. We stand up for America. This is what we do. Whole different ballgame when you talk about the why. Yeah, and I and I don't know that it's fair to be critical of that generation. If something else happened, yeah. you know, if there's another national crisis, sure, uh, I think people will do the same thing. They'll yeah. they'll yeah. to volunteer. Uh, you know, and we've always had. You know, people didn't volunteer a lot during the Vietnam War. It wasn't a just war, right. uh, and that and that was why we had there had to be a draft uh, for that. You know, if, you know, I don't know that how many people were joining uh, the armed forces because of Iraq. You know, they did go to where they wanted to fight terrorists in Afghanistan, and that was a noble, noble cause. Mm -hmm. You know, Iraq, all we did was practically destroy a culture, you know, and, and it, it really, it really is a stain on George Bush's uh, yeah. presidency. Uh, not only did it kill thousands of people in it, in it uh, you know, because of his daddy complex and his um, wanting to be better than his dad and finish the job that his dad started. You know, he, they invented ma weapons of mass destruction uh, and chased out a bad guy, but, you know, we're allies with lots of bad guys. Uh, so, you know, that that's a real stain on his on his presidency. And not only that, it, it put us into debt yeah. You know, the, in, in this country, we're still trying to recover from uh, the the amount of money uh, the two wars cost this country. Yeah. Despite and 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 not to mention the deaths that cost this country. Let's talk a little bit about what's happening now with the September 11th. I don't want to call them suspects because we kind of all know they did it, but they haven't technically been brought to trial or convicted, and they are still at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. And there are now plea negotiations underway. Have you been following this with what's happening? So the plea, oop, beep, beep, hello. The, hello um, one second. 
The plea negotiations could mean that none of the September 11th defendants will face the death penalty in these cases. This is an AP story posted yesterday. Um, And this is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, mastermind of the September 11th attacks. This is four others held at Guantanamo Bay. Um, their, their trials have been delayed, uh, legal disputes, legal ramifications of interrogation under torture of the men that were originally in CIA custody. So no trial has been set. Uh, the families that of the victims are saying that they think the, that no trial has been held or that plea, uh, agreements are being reached because, the United States doesn't want Saudi Arabia implicated in the planning or the details of September 11th, that there's some type of conspiracy in this way. Um, The office of the chief prosecutor, according to the government, has been negotiating as as is considering entering into pre-trial agreements. Uh, no, they tell the families, while no plea agreement has been finalized and may never be finalized, it is possible that a pretrial agreement in this case would remove the possibility of the death penalty. Is that what we want? What are your thoughts about what's happening with that? I mean, is that what we expected? We, th- I think we thought when we caught these guys, you know, that was it, that they'd be locked up forever or that they would face death. Oh, you're on mute. I mean, they killed nearly 3,000 Americans. If that's not, I, I'm not a fan of the death penalty, but if that's not a reason, you know, to use it, I don't know what is. Yeah, um, it is a very, it's a difficult situation. Uh, we, the Guantanamo uh, situation is not America's finest moment. Are there alternatives? You know, the problem politically is that anytime a Democrat or a president has talked about, it's been Democrats since Bush, since Bush and except for even Trump talked about it, closing Guantanamo. Um, the question is, what do you do with those people? Uh, the, the concern was if you let them go back to their home countries, that they would again uh, become terrorists. Uh, I'm not. I'm not concerned about embarrassing Saudi Arabia, and I don't think most of the country is. Saudi Arabia is beyond embarrassment. Um, I think there is a concern uh, that where to put them, and that we want to house them in the United States in some lockup uh, somewhere in Colorado, which is a maximum security. I'd kind of vote for that and let them let them rot. But the problem is they haven't had a trial. Yeah. You know they haven't. You know these military tribunals were not really trials. Uh, so, you know, I, I would be for closing Guantanamo and sending them to these maximum security places we have around the, around the country, uh, in Colorado someplace, um, or building a, a separate one for them, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm against the death penalty because, uh, you know, we, that's a whole other discussion, but until we can, un, until we can know for sure that someone is guilty, um, you know, there's too many mistakes made on death row, people being let out, where the final solution uh, would not um, allow that to happen. So that's that's why I'm against it, you know, mostly. We can't be, yes. if we can't create life uh, as gods, we shouldn't be able to take away life as gods, in my opinion. So think, anyway, that's I my think, summation. <laughs> I think the family members, at least the one quoted in this AP story, they're saying the case needs to go through the legal process, not be settled in a plea deal. I think they want their day in court. You know, that these are people that lost fathers, mothers, sisters, what have you. They want their day in court. They want to go and sit in the, you know, in the courtroom and they want to see the people that took away their family members. And by entering into a plea deal, even 22 years later, it robs them of that moment. Yeah, they, they have a point. I mean, I think they should have um, some kind of trial um, to to be a part of, to witness, uh, and then they should go away. The problem with it is, is that one of the reasons we didn't have trials is because the evidence against these people was slim. It was based on uh, informants, uh, based on people we can't name, 
people we can't reveal, tactics we can't reveal, because yeah. um, it's all classified. You know, it's very difficult to have a, a, a free and open trial. Let uh, me just say, let me add, to, let me add to that. What you're saying is, there. The story I was reading says much of this is also because they don't know how much testimony they can actually put in because a lot of it was inadmissible because of torture that defendants underwent early in CIA custody. So as you were talking about how much, you know, how much evidence is there and how did you get the evidence, right? And right. is that evidence Absolutely. admissible in a court of law in the United States? People who know about, about this stuff, John McCain, for one, was against what was going on at Guantanamo because he knew as a former political prisoner himself that when you're tortured, you will say anything for the torture to stop. So who knows how much, how much of it was true, how much of it was guilt by association. Uh, you know, we knew Osama bin Laden was involved. We killed him. We knew the other guy whose name I can't remember who, was, who has died since. And we, we killed a lot of people uh, over there uh, who were involved with Al Qaeda and ISIS at this point. You know, but it's, it's some of it's sketchy information, you know, and you just have to be very careful about it. Yeah. Um, I saw, and thank you for telling your story and for being here with me on the Mark Thompson show today, because you really went through this as a reporter that, I mean, your experience is incredible and I, I, I feel it, you know, I know you're feeling it. I'm feeling it. So thank you for sharing it. I did see somebody in the chat wanted me to ask you a question on a completely different topic. Uh, and so I will do that. Uh, although I don't know if you've been following the story, but I'm sure you've seen it that over the weekend, um, there was a big hoopla in New Mexico when the governor of New Mexico uh, restricted firearms in that state. Uh, this is, let's see, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham issuing an emergency order suspending the right to carry firearms in public in and around Albuquerque, the state's largest city. She issued emergency orders suspending the right to carry firearms in public across Albuquerque and the surrounding county for at least 30 days because of gun violence there. And already there are calls for her to be impeached because of this. What's your take? Yeah, I think it's going to go to court and there's going to have an issue. And if it goes all the way to the Supreme Court, we know what's going to happen there. Yeah. Um, so valiant effort. Hopefully it would catch on. Um, you know, it, we have strict gun laws in California. Yeah. You know, they, so it's done. You know, it, it can be done locally. Um, sorry, hold on one second. I, I, right. I it, sounds like you're on an it sounds like you're on an airplane. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, I'm not. I'm in a clinic and I'm oh, having yeah. what is called an infusion, oh, uh, listen, which I have. You are so nice to come on with us. Once a month. Oh, uh, Jim. And so they're just wrapping up and that's what the noise okay. was. I apologize. Yeah. No, no problem. Um, so, um, you know, we, it can be done locally. So it's yeah. it's not bad that uh, that they're doing something like this. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it, it, like I was saying, it's California does it. Right. I don't, it doesn't, it's not going to do any good, unfortunately, until it's a national law. Because, you know, I lived in Chicago for many years, 30 years. Chicago has some of the strictest gun laws in the country. But what happens is Indiana is 30 miles away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when they go to Indiana, when they just go across the border to Indiana, and you can buy any gun you want, and they bring them over to bring them back to Chicago. Yeah. So, that's that's the issue. That's that's the problem. You know, hailed in New Mexico, but until Arizona, its neighbor, yeah. uh, you know, makes it impossible to buy guns and bring it to Albuquerque, yeah. then, um, then it's a problem. Well, you know, I could talk to you all day. I will never forget that you gave me your time on this day when you had a medical procedure going on and shared your story. And I think it meant a lot to people that are here watching the show as you recount the the details of what you went through just being a reporter uh and uh we can just imagine what people went through that were you know first responders and and were victims of that attack so jim avala thank you for being here
I love you. Thank you. I love sharing with one of you and our friends. Take care. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.